Thank you. It's great to be here. And, uh, when Caitlin invited me uh, a few months ago, this conference on big data, I didn't know what big data was. So I, I thought about it, and I came up with my own definition, which is pretty simple. This is, there's a transition that we went through, and I, nobody seems to know when we hit this transition, but I think it was a very important one. When the, the, so this is my definition of big data. It was when the human cost of making the decision to throw something away became higher than the machine cost of continuing to store it. And, and then we had big data. So, so I'm going to sort of tell you quickly the, the story of how, how we got here and where I think it might be going. So we're here 100 years since the birth of Alan Turing. It's the, we're getting near the end of the year celebrating his, his birth. And he's, he's the guy who sort of brought this, dragged us into this world we now live in. But he died, tragically, in 1954, right at the dawn of this world. So if we go back to 1953, when, when Turing was still alive, the digital universe at that time, you're actually looking at one kilobit, a 32 by 32 array of cathode ray tube, tube memory. And this very comprehensive global survey of computers at that time, if you add up all the numbers, the amount of fully random access high-speed storage, the stuff you take for granted in your phone or your camera today, was, it's easy to remember, it was 53 kilobytes in 1953. And we've gone from that, the methods of storing it continues to become smaller and smaller. It became more and more prevalent. Richard Feynman sort of looked at this, could see what was coming. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin, which of course we all do every, you know, millions of times a day. Now, Gordon Moore put this, formulated this as Moore's Law, that the number of transistors would double every 24 months, and we're, we're right on that path. If you, it's still a straight line, so it's now, effectively, if you look at today, it's, a, it's around roughly two trillion transistors per second that are adding to this and, they, and most of them have a, an IP address at this point. That's the, the other way of putting Moore's Law. Two bytes are better than one. And so this ended up in this, this world of big data centers. This was New York Times last week, this very dark, dismal view of the d data centers are, are going to suck up all the power on planet Earth, gave the number uh, 30 gigawatts, which I think, I think was totally wrong, but it, it alarmed people. The headline really should have been, the servers are now our masters, and, and it's, it's time to give up. But it's really not that bad. There's, there's huge improvements on the way. If we go back to the beginning, this was, in my view, the original data center here at the, at the Exchequer in England. This was a system of, of digital financial instruments uh, the exchequer tallies, where you corresponded the, the money that you gave to the king in notches on a stick, and then you split the stick. So it was the first time that money existed in two places at one time. I tried uh, making some. In fact, I brought one today. So uh, I would keep this, which encodes the digital data, and I would give you this, which is the stock. And then you could actually, this represented that you had money on deposit with the king, and you could sell this stock, which is the origins of the stock market. We started, so this was slow uh, speed trading. And then we, of course, we ended up getting high speed trading when all this, if you look at the time scale here, it all, it all happened in milliseconds. Somebody, and I think we know who, but we, we, for some reason, the Security and Exchange Commission will not say who. Somebody made off with a lot of money uh, in a fraction of a second. And, and, and then unexpectedly, they didn't, they didn't realize it was another algorithm trading on the other side. And that's what caused this uh, collapse. The person who saw this all coming was Thomas Hobbes here in, in the 17th century, writing in London, Leviathan, where he really could foresee the, sort of, the rise of, of 
the state as a, as a social network. And not only that, he explicitly said this would be, a, uh, this would be based on binary arithmetic on addition and subtraction, which were the only sort of fundamental uh, functions from which you could build everything else. Leibniz uh, over in, in, the, in Germany made this uh, much more rigorous and explicit with a system of binary arithmetic and binary coding and uh, even told us very clearly 400 years ago how to build a digital computer. You just need to make a system of tracks and you can roll tokens down these tracks and if you shift the tracks, you then get a, effectively a shift register and you can do all the, all the computation we do today, except he was using marbles and gravity. We do it with uh, electrons and a voltage gradient, but nothing has changed in 400 years except we do more and more and more of it faster and faster. Leibniz warned us that this was not just for you know, the merchant class, this was actually going to lead to, to something higher and more important, and you, you may still have your doubts. Charles Babbage, another you know, a big fan of big data, built his difference engine. It's right here in South Kensington at the Science Museum, and saw that the, the way to use data at that time was with punched cards that were already being used for looms, and developed a method of expressing by signs the action of machinery, which is, in my view, is, is pretty much the first programming language, an abstract, uh, what we now would call a programming language, although he didn't really see it that way as clearly as uh, Ada Lovelace, who, saw, who sort of described his ideas more, more eloquently than he could himself. And he made the conclusion that he converted the infinity of space, which was required by the conditions of the problem, into the infinity of time, which is what programmers do. They, you give them enough time, they'll, they'll solve your problem. Alfred Smee, also here in London, working for the Bank of England, uh, he became interested in, in what we now would call search engines, in looking at how the mind works and sort of searches for concepts and how you could actually build machines that did that, uh, way ahead of his time, you know, it occurred to him that you could, you could build a machine that would do this. He wrote it up in this uh, sort of proposal for this machine that unfortunately would be as large as the city of London and uh, would inevitably cause its own destruction and, and he gave up because he didn't, he, he didn't have uh, the tools we have today. Herman Hollerith, the first project to capture really big data were the, the mechanizing the census using punched cards, an enormous operation, uh, led to an entire new industry, which of course gave rise to, to IBM uh, in America and, and CTR over here. And Lewis Fry Richardson had the idea of putting, if you put enough people doing these computations together, you could model uh, the behavior of the real world in a digital form, and, and by his estimation, if you had 64,000 of these human computers in a huge room, like the Olympic Stadium here, they could actually model the equ difference equations of the atmosphere and keep up with the atmosphere itself, which it, again, in 1920 seemed like a crazy idea, now is, is something we, we do every day, that's how we get our weather forecasts. He also answered the question of artificial intelligence, which, which people wasted a lot of time arguing about it. I think with this circuit, an electrical model illustrating a mind having a will, now the sad part is capable of only two ideas. But you, you put enough of those together, it becomes capable of, a, as we know, a larger and larger number of ideas. And so you end up with something like Google, which essentially maps all the ideas that anybody uh, can possibly have. And if, if it doesn't have them yet, it, it will soon. So Alan Turing comes into this world in the, in the 1930s, where all this hardware already exists, but there's no unifying sort of concept to put it together, and gives us the commandment that, that it's really being digital that's the important thing. 
and that there's a way to do that. Now, he's trying to solve an abstract mathematical problem, the Entscheidungsproblem, sort of a decision problem, whether by looking at a string of code, can you, is there a systematic way to predict whether that code is a provable formula or not? The answer turns out to be no. Uh, but he does that by inventing, effectively, the modern digital computer. And not only that, but says you only need to invent one. You just build this one, we now call it the universal Turing machine, which all our computers are, are effectively versions of. And then you can do everything else with, with software. So that's the, where your industry comes from, uh, which seemed to have no application to the real world. In 1930, in fact, Alan Turing complains to his mother very bitterly that only, only two requests for reprints of his paper came in. He was, he was very, we went to America. Uh, in 1937, was really quite, quite depressed by the response. But back here in England, uh, we had the f a huge big data problem that the Germans were communicating with their U-boat fleet and were generating all this encrypted binary code that, uh, that the lives of this island country depended on breaking those codes. So that became the origins of the Colossus Project, this machine built largely by Thomas Flowers, through the post office that actually cracked those codes by, by putting them into a high speed, what we now would call a, a fully digital memory. So this was a uh, digital electronic computer, but not, not fully programmable in the sense that we, that we sort of require it today. But it worked extremely effect so effectively that it was uh, kept secret until, until 30 years or so ago. Alan Turing in 1946, uh, and that when the war was over, computers flourished. That's the EDSAC at Cambridge. The Pilot Ace, which was Turing's sort of personal project where his ideas went into this. Now the memory here is acoustic memory using uh, delay lines. So the memory is operating at the speed of sound. It's not yet operating at the, at the speed of light, which was the next uh, big transition. And that was started in, by the group in Manchester, led by Frederick C. Williams and Thomas Kilburn, who put together the Manchester machine, the first really stored program digital computer, using, putting the memory on the face of the cathode ray tube. And, even they, and they published the fact that this was, in fact, a universal Turing machine with a sort of tragic handicap, but, but only brief, that it, memory was only 32 words of 31 binary digits each. So a very tiny memory, but still with enough time, you could do anything. And then the machines got better and better and better. So by 1951, Alan Turing is working on the, at, again at Manchester with the Ferranti company. This was the first computer you could buy. You could actually pay money and order a copy. And the Important thing to remember is that Alan Turing, who we credit with, with sort of the father of deterministic computation, believed very strongly in non-deterministic computation. So he, he would not let this computer be designed and sold without including a hardware random number generator in, in the machine itself. So it generated not pseudo-random numbers, but real random numbers, which is a feature, if you are watching this, that Intel is finally putting in their next chip coming out in 2013 will be the first, because this is, this is now not an abstract problem, it's a real problem. To, how do we get real random numbers to do our encryption? So the important thing at Manchester was not so much that machine itself, but the idea of the cathode ray tube storage that was storage at the speed of uh, light, not the speed of sound. Johnny von Neumann on the American side comes along and grabs hold of that and, and runs with that idea. And uh, a lot of debate whether did he really follow Alan Turing or not. So I went and looked in his sort of his personal library at the institute where he worked. This is the copy of Alan Turing's paper. It was completely, it's the only volume of the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society that's even been opened and it's uh, completely torn apart from being consulted so frequently by the engineers. So he clearly credited Alan Turing. He, he was at Los Alamos, where suddenly there was another huge big data problem. These pure logicians were facing the, 
the task of building a nuclear weapon, where you had to follow the behavior of this exponentially increasing population of neutrons. Uh, how do you uh, code that and look at all the results? And it sort of became actually more interesting to von Neumann. The com computation itself became more interesting than the explosions. On the American side, we had the ENIAC, which was a, essentially a multiple core parallel processor. And that was used to do the first uh, Monte Carlo codes, which was an, a very successful algorithm for following uh, these populations of neutrons, invented by uh, Stan Ulam in the, when he was actually recovering from an illness. And they told him to stop thinking. He started trying to play solitaire. And that's how he came up with Monte Carlo. The codes. So this is the entire code for designing a hydrogen bomb in this one envelope. It's actually just four sheets of paper. So the, the codes were very small, but they ran, that particular code ran for six weeks. And then the input-output was essentially one bit. You get a one-bit answer, yes or no. Does, does this bomb explode or not? And so that was the first time we, we mapped such a large sort of data problem into the world of the computer and then back out into the real world with, with results. And did they realize what a terrible thing they were doing? Yes. So here's Edward Teller writing to von Neumann saying the factor four is a gift of God or the other party. It's actually von Neumann writing to Teller. So the other party was, they were well acknowledging they were doing the work of the devil to do this thing. Von Neumann worked closely with Robert Oppenheimer, so he had a unique ability to sort of deal with the people on the top and keep all the people down below who were really doing the work, the engineers and the programmers, keep them happy and put this project together. Uh, it began in 1945 with the idea that the words coding the orders are handled in the memory just like numbers. So the data and the instructions are in the same storage accessible at the speed of light. Let a word 40 binary digits be two orders. Each order is a command and an address. That's where the origins of the command line that, that all our programming is still done. So the Turing machine was a one-dimensional model of a, a linear tape. You had to go to the right point in the tape. What von Neumann did was, was change this to a two-dimensional model. So if you look at that machine, it has 40 memory cylinders, one bit of each word in each. So, so effectively, you have a, it's like a stack of 32 by 32 chessboards, 40 chessboards deep. So you have this two-dimensional matrix. And if you put a 10-bit uh, coordinate and a 10-bit instruction, that's 20 bits, you get back a 40-bit string. And that's what, what really they're doing is very fat. Each tube has its own uh, logbook documenting its idiosyncrasies. So you have this matrix. You put in 20 bits, you get 40 bits back, and that has never stopped. It's, that's really why we are here today. We're just trying to use this explosion of bits that is, so the 18-8 is, is one of these two-dimensional coordinates, and then you get back a 40-bit string, and the whole thing exploded from there. That was their, their problem. How did they deal with large input-output? That's their prototype hard disk drive. It's a, uh, it's a magnetic wire input-output drive, and they could get 90,000 bits per second. That's what a 40-bit word looked like. So this is the transition from analog to digital. They worked on a whole range of big data problems from evolution of numerical organisms modeling real evolution to even looking at traffic flow on, uh, on highways. If you look at what they worked on, just in this, so their total memory space was five kilobytes, 32 by 32 by 40 bit matrix. They worked on these five problems on different time scales, nuclear explosions in millions of seconds, shock waves over a few seconds, meteorology in the middle, biological evolution over thousands and millions of years, and the evolution of stars and solar systems over billions of years. You compare that on our scale, so the blink of an eye is the fastest we can perceive a human lifespan. And uh, we're right in the middle. A working day is just in the middle of that. Julian Bigelow was the engineer who, who actually did this and is worth listening to what he thought uh, should happen next. So he was there at the beginning, choosing how to you know, how to even do something as fundamental as an and or gate, we take totally for granted. And he was the last person on the machine when it shut down at midnight on July 15th, 1958. And what he tells us, he spoke very little after this. He just, he got bitter that the project had been shut down. That 
there's no time in the machine. We, the problem is we named, our, we gave our computers a clock speed, and we think they have clocks, but they don't. They're governed by sequence, not by time. That's the difference between the digital universe and our universe. There's no clocks. There's a difference between a counter and a clock. The computer only deals in sequence, which is different from time. No time is there. And that's why the digital universe continues to go from our point of view, faster and faster and faster, and if you're in the digital universe, our world is just slowing down. So Julian there at the end finally spoke up in the 1960s, rather irritated that when they built this machine, which was copied everywhere in the 1940s, they no way expected this architecture would remain with us for 60 years. I mean, they, they did this to solve a specific weapons problem and, and thought that in a year or two, the designers would design better computers. But it became the basis of programming, and then programming became the basis of building new hardware. We're just stuck in this repetitive loop that we ha are having a hard time escaping from, that we, we program in a recursive way, because that's the only way we can generate enough instructions for the machines, you know, to keep up with the machines who are waiting for the next instruction. And so we have the, these billions of computational elements of which only one is active at one time. It's the most, in, the, the modern computing system is the most inefficient machine that the human race has ever constructed. Um, and it doesn't need to be that way. We have all this data in, in the real world and we have all this power of processing the data in between and there's this tiny little step-by-step -step process of going back and forth and, it, and then these two large worlds on, on each side. And sort of one way of calling that is a, a von Neumann uh, bottleneck. Part of the problem is that we give every piece of data has to have a specific address and most of what computers are doing is just straight bookkeeping keeping track of addresses. Again, it doesn't need to be that way. It's not how computing is done in biology. Uh, von Neumann, again, looked at the future and saw a very different future but sort of nobody was listening. Gave, I think, some of the best advice that it's, the problem is it's easier to write a new code than understand an old one. And, uh, so we just get all this stuff piled up on the old stuff without really understanding it. Uh, and the tragedy was that, that von Neumann had this direct connection to IBM. In fact, it's not known. It was sort of unethical. He was consulting for IBM. That's why we live in this world where we follow this one particular architecture and all the alternatives were sort of, were sort of squashed. And some of them, are, there's a chance they may come back. If you go to, this is the... Uh, American supercomputer that holds all the nuclear weapons design. It's the, the relic of what happened in the 40s. And I think if you went to the headquarters of, of GCHQ here, you'd find the same thing, that all these machines, at, at their heart, they are just running the same way. What's next? In my view, that was, uh, Turing gave us this very effective, one, powerful one-dimensional model. But Neumann made it into this two-dimensional address matrix, and why are we still stuck in that world? We're fully capable of moving on to the next, a completely new generation of computation that becomes fully three-dimensional. Uh, why stay in this von Neumann address matrix? Where biology is all template-based addressing. That's the reason Google is so successful, is that they are giving us sort of a template-based addressing system, but programmers are not fully effectively taking advantage of that. Pulse frequency coding, which was von Neumann's particular thing, was that that's what makes the brain robust and uh, immune to failure, is that the coding is not digital, it's coded with pulse frequencies, which is sort of how Facebook and, and uh, PageRank and so on are, are very primitive systems of pulse frequency coding, but that I think is the way of the future. And ultimately, uh, we're not restricted to digital computing. There's things that analog computing can do that digital computing can't. And for a last word with, with Alan Turing, sort of at, at the end, uh, he's famous for asking, can machines think? And he said, of course, but, but not if they're infallible. If they're infallible, they will never have intelligence. In, intelligence becomes from making mistakes and learning from them, and <clears throat> that what we need to do is not build perfect computers, which is the world we have today, but imperfect computers that, that can survive mistakes. If you look at, at, I mean, Turing got sort of typecast with one idea, but already in 1938, when he was in Princeton, he worked on 
he, he already was getting bored with deterministic computation and wrote systems of logic based on ordinals, ordinals which, in which he discusses what he calls oracle machines, which are deterministic. They work the way the mind works. They work sort of through deterministic logic, and every once in a while they make, into, they make leaps of intuition. And he was wondering how you can sort of map between ingenuity and intuition, assume it, ingenuity to be available in unlimited supply, which is the world we have today, where we have sort of unlimited number of machine cycles, unlimited ingenuity. And your job, I think, as working with big data is to take all that ingenuity and develop uh, intuition, which is really what we're looking for. When you have this massive, massive amount of data, it really takes intuition to find the uh, things that people want out of it. Thank you.